Thanks, David, for uh, for setting this up. I'm going to talk about atmospheric deposition to the che uh, Chesapeake Bay and um, the agricultural contributions of that, um, much like David has talked about the ag agricultural contributions of the atmospheric deposition to um, to the uh, total U.S. And then I'm going to talk about modeling and particularly how we're using the modeling to um, identify areas where we might be able to best implement um, best management practices or most effective best management practices. Um, get this to move forward. There we go. Okay, so um, essentially the uh, the problem or the water quality issues within the Chesapeake Bay um, are due to excess, excess nutrient loading um, from both um, atmospheric sources and um, overland sources, as well as groundwater sources that contribute to um, a low dissolved oxygen conditions within the bay. And those can then lead to um, uh, dead zones, fish kills, and, 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 and such. Um, the graphic I have here on the right is a figure from the Chesapeake Bay uh, program that's documenting where we had the highest dead zones, the average uh, size of the dead zones in the early or in the mid 80s, and then how that's uh, that's reduced. There's a lot of variability in it, but it does appear that um, we are making uh, progress in um, reducing the the loads, uh, reducing the dead zone as well as reducing the loads. Um, I will. Uh, and that the, um, climate change is an additional stressor that we're now looking at, um, particularly on how that's impacting ecosystem resources and water quality. Um, the Chesapeake Bay program and its projects um, involved a lot of monitoring. We do a lot of water quality monitoring. monitoring. We utilize um, the NADP data and the CASNET data for the air quality side of things, and then a lot of modeling. We need um, continuous fields of, of deposition. Um, and so we use, we use models uh, for that. And we also need to model how that nitrogen deposited to the watershed is then um, transported into the bay or deposited directly to the bay. And then quality assurance. Are we modeling and measuring um, what we need to? Are the plans that we're um, coming up with to reduce the loads to the bay reasonable and, um, and so forth? And then there's a, a land assessments and such, which uh, takes into account what areas, um, what are we trying to protect, what um, what resources and and and, and such, um, where essentially should we put our resources, and this is all governed under the Chesapeake Bay Total Maximum Daily Load um, uh, legislation, and essentially this is this is very similar to a critical load, but it is the um, Clean Water Act uh, version of that, and essentially it sets a daily limit of loads to the bay um, at which um, if we if it is exceeded, we would expect the um, ecosystem's uh, degradation to happen, like increase, dissolve ox uh, dead zones and so forth. And if we are able to achieve um, the loads below that, we would expect ecosystem recovery. And then watershed implementation plan is essentially how we um, plan to achieve the total daily maximum load. And the best management plans are, um, are the tools used in the water implementation plans. And um, so as we go through this, where um, we lay out our tools um, and then like uh, the legislation to guide how we, um, we implement those and then um, basically um, a verification process to see if we are achieving the goals that we expected. So this is the uh, Chesapeake Bay modeling system. I'm not going to go over everything into uh, detail, but essentially the inputs are on your left-hand side and, and the outputs are on the right. And what goes into it are like land use data, observations, um, both from the air quality and the water quality um, side of things. Um, emissions data and so forth. And we have a land use change model. The atmospheric deposition is an input and then that's put into a, um, a watershed model, which is essentially a runoff model where we estimate the transport of the pollutants once they're deposited to the ground to the Chesapeake Bay and then the estuary model where we actually estimate the things such as um, the dead zone within the bay. And then those outputs are used to build a number of tools for policymakers where they can look at where the loads are coming from and um, run through scenarios looking at different um, best management practices. So I'm going to now shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about the Chesapeake Bay 
and the nutrients and the modeling over time. Um, my first slide here is from a publication we had with uh, Doug Burns in 2021, and it was uh, looking at loading to the Chesapeake Bay watershed from 1985 up to projections uh, to 2050. And um, in that, we um, uh, we looked, we see a very large, or we see a, a decrease with the um, wet deposition of nitrate and um, and a decrease in the, the NOx emissions, which is uh, oxidized nitrogen from combustion sources. Essentially, that's the, uh, the nitrogen emissions to the atmosphere, which are covered under the Clean Air Act. When we look at um, ammonium, we, in the observations, these are observation plots on the, on the left here, you don't really see um, a, uh, a change in it very much. You see the ammonium in the wet deposition has remained fairly constant, and the dry deposition has decreased a bit. But the ammonium dry deposition is just the particle portion of it. And if you look at um, our change in the aerosol loading or the particles in the atmosphere over that particular set of time, those have gone down too. And when we bring ammonia into the into the mix, um, the ammonia deposition is dry deposition is much much higher than the ammonium uh, dry deposition. And if it doesn't, if the ammonia doesn't have a particle to stick to, it tends to um, stick to the surface. And we also see the um, the breakdown of various um, uh, uh, nitrogen um, loadings within to within the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that the atmospheric deposition is one of the largest uh, loadings to the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and it's on the order of um, uh, fertilizer and, and manure um, in in those areas. And um, that deposition, the composition of that deposition has been changing over time, as, um, as David had talked about. Uh, David had shown uh, national maps, and here we're looking just at the Chesapeake Bay program, and our Chesapeake Bay watershed. And we have a set of historical simulations up to um, uh, 2012 in these, uh, uh, these series where we see a decrease in the total deposition, but the, uh, the blue slices in here are um, the ammonium, ammonia and ammonium portions of those depositions. And those are increasing over, um, over the time period as we are reducing our um, emissions from things like uh, automobiles and power plants and such. So as we reduce our oxidized emissions uh, from combustion, over time, the agricultural contribution is growing. And the 2002 to 2004 series, the contribution from agriculture to the uh, nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere was about a quarter. And if we project out to 2050, and this is a, an older projection that we published with um, the postdoc of mine, uh, Patrick Campbell in 2019, we had estimated about 60% um, of the deposition at 2050 under the RCP 4.5 scenario to be from agricultural sources. Um, as of now, we're pretty close to 50-50 in the, in the Chesapeake Bay. And looking at the nitrogen loading by source, this is just a, another snapshot of um, the, the loading over time from 1985 to 2020. The atmospheric deposition, um, and this is the delivery to the Chesapeake Bay, so this is the nitrogen that goes into the, the bay itself that then is available. Um, for algal blooms and so forth that contribute to the, um, the, the dead zone. We had about a 30, uh, 31 percent of the total uh, nitrogen delivered to the bay in 1985 was from atmospheric deposition. And that really hasn't changed over the time period all, um, because the total loads have been uh, decreasing, or the total loads from the atmospheric deposition have been decreasing, and um, the loads from the wastewater due to improved wastewater management have really, uh, really decreased. This um, this point here at the far right of the plot is the um, watershed implementation plan or the the loads that we want to reach um, to achieve the uh, the TMDL. Um, and you can see the manure um, in the Chesapeake Bay region has um, has decreased a little bit. There's been an increase in fixation and fertilizer has remained um, has and it gone uh, up and down, but hasn't seen the same, neither of those have seen the same reduction in uh, loading as we have from wastewater or atmospheric deposition. 
Now, when we want, when we're looking at how to um, reduce the uh, nitrogen deposition to the bay, we really want to bring that back into um, the sources. Where is the nitrogen deposition? Uh, where are the nitrogen emissions coming from? And um, which uh, which sectors and which areas would be um, uh, the most effective uh, for reductions uh, to uh, reduce the load to the bay. And we have to use uh, modeling for that. Um, and right now we're using um, CMAC, which is EPA's air quality model to track the emissions and regional sources um, of the pollutants numerically. And we can break it down by um, what's emitted. You you'll notice the total here is, um, is on the order of, um, at least from the, uh, the locally emitted species is about 80%. So it's similar to, um, to the, actually the emission totals, but then we can numerically um, estimate that say, as far as like the poultry em emissions, 3.2% of the deposition is coming from say poultry production in the Delmarva um, Peninsula or the Central West would include the Shenandoah Valley, which is another high, high poultry area and, and so forth. And this provides, um, information that's really useful to um, to evaluate scenarios that look at best management practices for those particular sectors. Um, one thing that's really exciting is these um, type of source contributions are now um, uh, becoming, uh, we can actually take measurements that can verify those through um, isotopic uh, measurements because the um, there's an isotopic signature that's different for animal production versus chemical fertilizers and combustion sources and so forth. So this is something that's really coming along and we're hoping to use to um, better understand how our model is partitioning the uh, deposition between sources and um, how well um, these, these tools work. So, and that brings me to um, how can we verify the model results? Um, we're talking about implementing best management practices here to reduce loads to Chesapeake Bay, and there's um, a lot of resources going into it. We want to make sure we're using those as effectively as we can. And really, the first um, set of things we, we go through with the, the, C, um, the model is um, evaluating it against the observations. How does CMAT compare against, um, say, the National Atmospheric Deposition Program um, estimates? And these are the uh, the loads that we provided the Chesapeake Bay program compared against the NADP um, uh, measurements for both ammo ammonium, uh, nitrate, sulfate, and precipitation. And um, we break it up by region so we can see if there's um, regional differences and, and um, how well it's performing there, which gives us an idea of, um, you know, uh, what sort of, um, certainty we have in the model estimates. And this is for wet deposition. For uh, dry deposition, we do use the CASNET observations. And here we have um, SO, uh, uh, SO2, sulfate, um, and nitrate, and ammonium. And again, it's, it's very similar in that we um, break it down by, um, by uh, region within the, the, the country and, and evaluate it that way. Um, the ammonia, co ammonia concentration measurements are sparse and they weren't used in uh, this particular um, evaluation because we are looking at um, loads that go back to um, the early 2000s and um, we didn't have uh, ammonia concentration measurements there. Although that's, um, and recognizing that that's a increasing um, uh, proportion of the load, um, we are working with um, our partners, both with the USDA um, and EPA and uh, academic to uh, take uh, dry deposition measurements. And this is a, um, a uh, quantum cascade laser um, open path sensor in Idaho over a field where we can actually measure the um, ammonia uh, volatiz uh, volatizing off the, uh, the, the field um, uh, with uh, with that data, and then evaluate how our model parameterizes um, those values. Um, uh, nitric acid and ammonia are the largest contributors to dry deposition. We really understand the nitric acid deposition quite well, um, and it's declining due to emission reductions because it's a secondary product of um, a nitrogen oxide emissions 
and um, it's going down as we reduce the uh, uh, the emissions from combustion uh, sources. Ammonia dry deposition is less well understood, but we're doing a number of laboratory and field experiments to better understand it and um, improve our model estimates. So in summary, um, uh, nitrogen loading to the Chesapeake Bay has decreased from um, 1985. The fraction of the reactive nitrogen in the atmospheric deposition, that would be ammonia and ammonium to the Chesapeake Bay from, uh, and those are largely from, or the, the fraction of ammonia and ammonium um, in the deposition from the Ch uh, to the Chesapeake Bay is increasing over that period. And that's largely from nitrogen, or largely from agriculture, sorry. And we have developed uh, methods to estimate the emission sources and the contribution of those, uh, um, uh, the emission source contributions of those depositions. And um, re, um, the modeling and the measurement tools that we, uh, that we put together um, using the NADP data as well as uh, CMAC is, uh, is being helped uh, use develop tools which help water quality managers um, assess areas where BMPs would be most effective. And um, we're looking forward to recent measurements that will help us uh, assess how well our uh, model source apportionment is working. That's the, uh, this is my last slide. And um, this will be taking questions later. I will um, pass it on to uh, Mahmoud. Uh, 